Please open your Bibles to the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to continue to speak about our giving as Christians to finance the work of the Lord's church. I want us to be mindful because we studied this last week a one particular verse that's always in the back of my mind since I first read it, and I couldn't tell you when that was. But in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 8, the apostle says to us, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. I mentioned last week that means as an apostle I could give you apostolic direction and thus command you, but I've chosen to give you at the beginning of the chapter the example of the poor Macedonians and that they gave of themselves, thus they gave more than I even anticipated in their giving. And then, of course, he brings it down as to an example, uses as an example a pattern to the Corinthians, because that's the letter or the people to whom he's writing. And he says, there's your example. Now, you're a rich church. They're poor people. If they gave what they could give, which likely wasn't much as far as what the Corinthians could give, but was a whole lot more than what Paul thought they could give. And he says, now, you follow the same pattern, and you give the same way. So he brings it down to verse 8. And now it's the latter part, the last few words of the verse that ought to make us really do some serious consideration to what we give. I'll read the whole verse again. Paul says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. Now watch. And to prove the sincerity of your love. When you read that, what does that do to you? The whole context is their giving. Giving of their means. We looked at 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. We saw that what he said to the Corinthians there, he had given orders in the same way before that to the Galatian churches. And they were to give on the first day of every week. They were to lay by in store and thus put it aside at home so they could give it on the first day of the week. So it would be in a common treasury. So as Paul came, he could pick up the money and take it with him along with the other contributions from other churches to help the poor saints down in Jerusalem and Judea. Then here is this letter, a second letter to the same church. And in the reading of these verses, we find out that they had promised a year before to make their contribution, but they had not followed through with it. And then he says, let me give you an example of the Macedonians, and they full well knew the state of Macedonia, the econ economy there, and the troubles they had had, rebellious wars and fighting. And I'll say again, as I did last week, they gave... And it even surprised Paul. And they begged him to take what they could give. You can almost see the apostle saying, you need this here. But no, they wanted to give because, you know, if you, if you really want to receive help, then go to the people who have undergone what you've undergone. People who have lost everything they had in a house fire, they're going to have a first-hand understanding of what happens when somebody else loses their belongings and everything they've got in the house fire, and they're out to jump in and help because they've been there, done that. And that's what's happening right here. Now, the Holy Spirit's having Paul select this to urge these brethren to do what they ought to do. Now, let me emphasize that part again, to urge these brethren to do what they ought to do. I don't know why we can obey the gospel, be added to the church, our past sins remitted, have the expectation of heaven, 
be a child of God, and we have to be urged to do things that are characteristic of Christians, which means of Christ. But that's the way we are. And as I've said so many times lately, most of the New Testament's written to those who are members of the church, or to churches, of course. But he says to prove the sincerity of your love. When you're making up your mind to put however much you contribute money-wise into the plate when it's passed, do you think of that as Paul by the Holy Spirit described to these brethren of 2,000 years ago almost, that that's proving the sincerity of your love? Now, Paul, you'll remember said concerning the Macedonians that the reason they surprised him and what they gave, which as I say again, was not likely as much as uh, the Corinthians would even think about giving. They had so much more in material goods. Yet he says why anybody really does anything like God wants them to as one of his children in his family. They first gave themselves. Then Paul says, you're giving to prove something. If you ever say to somebody, say, what are you trying to prove? Are you trying to prove something to me? Well, it's the Holy Spirit saying to God's children here, remember these people know the plan of salvation. They've obeyed it. They worship correctly. Now, they've had a lot of problems. You can read about those problems in the church. Uh, there in verse Corinthians, Paul's correcting them. But do I ever think of what I am giving of my means as being proof of the sincerity of my love of God? Paul says that's what it is. And I think that's worth thinking of. In verse 9, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Paul had an outlook on things that really few of us have. When you see him having to appeal to Caesar to get out from under the unbelieving, hypocritical, and murdering Jews, Paul will then talk about himself as a prisoner of the Lord. What does he mean? Well, because of my faithful service to God, determination to do his work, I find myself in prison. But he calls it the prisoner of the Lord because why is he there? He didn't transgress any laws of the land. He even said one time, if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. What is he saying? He's saying, whatever comes upon me, whether it's persecution or good, because I preach the gospel, live the gospel of Christ, is part of my life. It's what I expect. I'm not going to be grumbling and mumbling about it and complaining and, oh, woe is me and all of this, because it just goes along with the territory. Now, in other things in life, we see that. I'll pick on Jonathan back here since he's taking the comfort chair and I don't want to go to sleep. Jonathan has just put himself through a considerable amount of training. He wanted, he wanted to be a fireman and all that they do nowadays. Why didn't he just go down to them and just hire out? Because it takes study and it takes training and it takes preparatory work so you'll know what you're going to do. Now, the truth of the matter is, I don't just have to pick him, but he just went through that. And we might remember Jonathan in our prayers. He starts work tomorrow. Maybe the Montgomery won't burn down tomorrow, but <laughs> if it does, he's got, we know one of the firefighters. But the point is, we recognize that and everything to prove the sincerity of your involvement in anything. In this case, prove the sincerity of your love. That's what your contribution shows. I just don't believe, brethren, understand that. I don't believe as they sit down during the week 
and consider what they're going to contribute on the first of the week. That God is sitting there as you go through your mind saying, what's he going to choose? What's he going to choose? Because it will prove the sincerity of your love of God. You can proclaim your love of God all you want to. You can say you're a faithful child of God all you want to. But the proof is in the giving. Jesus said to his apostles, John 14, verse 15, If you love me, ye will keep my commandments. Now this is a command. It is an act of worship on the first day of the week. We pray. We observe the Lord's Supper and so on. It is an act of worship. It proves the sincerity of our love because it causes us to say how much of me is going to help the church. Notice he calls this grace, this favor. In other words, there's terrible things happening to the churches down in Judea and Jerusalem and that area. Famine's there and people are starving. I also want to see the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians brought closer together. And here's a way that we can do that when we have the Gentile Christians up here in Corinth and Galatia and other places make this contribution to help the Jewish Christians. I imagine it's still very hard for us to realize what a separation there was between Jews and Gentiles and how hard it was to get them pulled back together in the gospel where all men are made one. But nevertheless, he saw this as an opportunity to do that. But it proves the sincerity of your love. It's the grace of God that's allowed you to get into position. That's what I meant a moment ago when I said Paul, when he went to prison, said, I'm the prisoner of the Lord. It was the favor of the Lord that put him there. And he looked at it that way. We need to change our outlook on life. It's part of being truly from the heart converted. But how many things that Paul look on as a favor that we look on as a hardship? I want you to think about that. Be honest with God and yourself how we look at it. So I want to mention a few things, and then the sermon will be yours. And that's this first thing, the principle of grace. I mentioned usually, and you know this, that we think of grace as the favor of God that gives us the gospel, and we don't deserve it and can't merit it. But we can receive it by belief and obedience from the heart of the gospel. And when we look at this, this is the favor of God, but we don't realize the favor of God poured out on us that we don't deserve just to be born in America. You realize as a Christian, I'll have to give an account someday before Christ of being a Christian in America. Why would that be the case? Because of what we're just born into here. What we just have and take for granted here. That most of world history never knew what all we got in America. And yet the church above all people ought to know that. In using the freedoms we have to spread the gospel. And frankly, it takes money to do that. It takes money for the church to function. Now, it can function without much of anything. Peter said when they went up, he and John to the temple to pray. And there was that lame man. When he spoke to the lame man, he thought... Uh, he was going to receive something, an alms from them. But Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the hand and lifted him up. And Luke says his ankle bones received strength. He jumped up, never had walked his whole life. That's an amazing thing. Something to truly rejoice about. And it was a sign that what they preached was the truth was God's truth and people need to believe it and obey it and become Christians and live godly lives. Well, what I just read here is part of the New Testament of Christ that our giving proves the sincerity of our love. 
But think of the grace of God, not just from it offering forgiveness of sins to us who don't deserve it, but the grace of God that gives you the opportunity to use what we have here to spread the gospel. In a sense, compared and contrasted with all the rest of the people on this earth, we were all born, to use an old-fashioned phrase, with silver spoons in our mouths. We don't realize it. Let me ask you to go home and look in your closets. What kind of clothes you have hanging there? And so many times we could clean out, I don't know how much of it, and give to somebody else. We still got all sorts of things. Look at the gadgets that you've got at the house. Every kind of gadget under the sun. Everybody wanting a new gadget. Look at all the other things. How many people in this world have riding lawnmowers or even push lawnmowers? Take that for granted. We don't, we just are caught up in so much material blessing, we can't see what we've got. Now, I don't know whether you thought about it or not, but I was thinking about this in the reading just a moment ago from the Scriptures. In Revelation chapter 3, And unto the angel of the messenger of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen. That means so be it. That's Christ. The faithful and true witness. That's Christ. The beginning of the creation of God. He's the first fruits of them that slip. I know thy works. That ought to make us freeze for a moment. Not a thought crosses our mind. Not any reasoning that goes on in our minds. And anything we plan on doing and why we do it is not known. By Christ. He knows it. Knows every bit of it. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thy work cold or hot. Lukewarm water is awful. Have you ever got some lukewarm water when you were very thirsty and you thought you were getting a cold drink of water and it just didn't set too well? What Christ is saying, I'd rather see you honestly and totally against me than I had pretending to be like you're really dedicated to me, but really you're not. You're either hot or cold. An atheist who declares God does not exist and Christ is not deity and the Bible is not the word of God and openly professes it, you know what he's saying here? He says, I appreciate that more than I do the person who says I'm something, but I'm not. Now that brings back up what we said. Giving proves the sincerity of your love. You remove giving from Christianity and you destroy it. So then because thou art, neither, thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The word spew is vomit. It's a nice way of the Lord saying, your giving makes me sick to my stomach. Your life claiming to be dedicated to God makes me sick at my stomach. I don't, uh, I don't think of Christ as being in two personages where he's petting people on the head saying coochie, coochie, coo one minute and then with the other hand slapping them down. It's the same person. He's saying, I will commend you when from the heart you do what I tell you. And I will rebuke you when you from the heart do contrary to what I tell you. Because thou sayest I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You think this is the only church that could ever be said truthfully about? When I read this, I have to ask myself, could that be me? Well, how can I tell whether it's me or not? <laughs> I have to look at my life. I have to look at what's been put into my care 
and how I'm using it. And I have to see the country. God blessed me by his favor that I didn't deserve to be born into and to have. And then on top of that, to be a member of his family in this world. Got your Christmas shopping done yet? Have you got all on your credit cards? You're going to put on your credit card to buy people gifts? Have you done that yet? Will you spend more than normal between now, if you haven't already done it, and the end of the year? Why? Why will you do that? Think about it. Why do you do it? I counsel thee, Jesus says, to buy me gold, try the fire. That thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And here's what we never have understood, not like we ought to. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You know, God gives us, as one of the principles behind our contributing of our means as an act of worship, He gives us all these things I've been mentioning, whether we want them or not. I want you to think about the sunshine, the rain. You didn't choose to be born into America, but you're here. One who did choose you to be here providentially. To ask that question is to answer it. Matthew 5, 44, God gives to the unjust that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. The Bible says he gives to the ignorant in Acts 14, 17. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. He gave the gift above all of his only begotten son to his enemies for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life, Romans 5.10. And here's the amazing thing. When people are sitting around thinking about what they're going to drop in the plate, he always gives us more than we can give to him. You can't outgive God. In 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and is able to make all favor or grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. What is he saying? When you read that, do you say, what does he mean when it comes to me? And I read this, do I understand it? What he's really saying is whatever God has taught you to do that's part of being faithful to him as a work of the church, and being ready unto every good work, what is it? Well, it's just simply that he's always going to make it abound where you can do it. He's always going to make it. First, there must be that willingness, and then God's going to take care of it. Now, that requires faith on your part and mine that he will do it. It's sort of like Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I've been around quite a while in the churches. Talked to a lot of folks, been around longer than I was, and they're all gone now. Read a lot of books on this. And I don't know that people, even yet in the church, as they ought to, understand what is being said here. You can't outgive God. And if you know it's part of the work of the spiritual body of Christ of which you are a member, you can just give and give and give, and he'll make it possible for you to give more. 
I don't think we believe that. I don't think our faith overall as a church, not just the congregation here, but throughout the land, really understands how God can do that. But he can. He says he will. I think he's true to his word. If I can believe Acts 2.38 concerning a believer needing to repent and be baptized for the mission of sins by the authority of Christ, I can understand this. It's a matter of is it mixed with faith. We look at those people wandering in the wilderness. We read Hebrews saying that uh, they had the truth. The gospel was preached unto them as well as unto, unto us. Well, why didn't it profit them? It was mixed with faith. Well, you read a verse like this concerning Christian living. We enjoy the blessings of God. Our past sins are remitted. We've been added to the church by the Lord himself. We have the blessings that come to only those who are faithful members of the church. And yet we still kind of say, well, I just don't see how I can do that. I just don't see how. Years and years ago, when I was reading this in an old gospel advocate from the 19th century, some good while ago, one of the preachers, because you, you have taught in 2 Corinthians 8 also, that we're to grow in this grace also. How do you grow in your giving? You ever ask yourself that question? Growing in giving must mean you give more with a better understanding of why you do that. How do you grow in giving more? How do you do that? Well, he was saying one time, he had planned on giving so much, had it all planned out. But when he reached in his pocket where he thought what he had planned out was, he got a bill that was bigger than what he intended to give. And he almost put it back, and he thought, now why would I do that? So he just went ahead and put it in the plate. And he said, you know, I never missed it. I never missed it at all. I could give more than I thought I could. And that's how I learned that I needed to grow. And the only way you can grow is when you decide on the basis of your faith that God can supply you, whether you understand how or not, and you give a little more. You do believe you ought to grow in this grace also. I hope if, I, if we don't believe that, then we got a problem with believing part of the Word of God. So we find then that if we're going to grow in our grace, it just means we've got to have enough faith in God to give a little more. Always remember you'll never outgive God. You can't do it. All you've got to do is go back and read and think about and meditate on Jesus Christ and the cross. And then ask yourself, can I afford to give this? Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, Honor the Lord thy, with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. What's he saying? Same thing was said over in 2 Corinthians 9 and 8. Whatever God expects you to do, it's a part of Christian living, part of your faithfulness, a part of developing your character and the likeness of Christ. Then prove the sincerity of your love and give. How do you grow in this grace also? You give a little more now and then. You find out you can. And guess what God's going to do? Well, what did he say here? Do you believe his word? Talk about people not believing the passages about baptism and what it does. And we'll turn right around and not believe this part. Well, remember our giving on the first day of the week is an act of worship. Is God pleased with that worship? Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 17, charge them that are rich in this world. Charge them. You know what that says? Get on their case. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Now listen, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. What does that mean to you? What lesson do you get from that? How does that speak to you? It should, because you know this all be open on their judgment. It's a terrible time then to say, well, I never really thought about that much, Lord. That won't work. Matthew 7, 9 through 11. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish will give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, 
know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? You know, James talked about brethren asking for the things. They didn't receive it because they ask amiss. They ask amiss. To consume it upon their lust. Well, I'd like to have that car. Please give me a raise so I can afford to buy that car. That's what he's talking about. Do we ever pray that we might have more to give to the work of the church and all of that involves? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. When he says so loved, it means how much love did he put into it? He gave his only begotten son. John later in 1 John 4.10 said along that same line, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be at the propitiation of our sins. I like to think I love God. I like to think my love today is stronger than it was years ago. I made myself a promise many, many years ago. I've tried to stay with it, and I think I have. Back in my teen years, when I really made up my mind to be faithful to God as best I could, I said, from this point forward, I'm going to look back over my life when I completed a year, and I'm going to see how much more I've learned that I didn't know and I'm going to think there's something not right if I don't know more in a year than I do now, <laughs> whatever it might be. Well, I've never been able to say that I haven't learned something in all those years. And it's been a long time now. I still review that in my mind because I don't know any other way to do it as a mere human being to try to figure out what I'm doing with my life. And is it pleasing to God? Surely we don't think God expects us to rise from water to grave of baptism and remain a babe in Christ. Obviously, that was a problem to the Hebrews Christians because he said, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need again to one teaching you the first principles of the oracles of God. And you can't chew meat. You still have to have milk when really that's pastime. Where do I fall in this? If there were no more reason to give than this, the reason should well up in our hearts. And souls to spring forth the most abundant giving <coughs> that we should possibly undertake. But there's more. Again, for we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he for your sakes became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. I like the idea of being rich. Do you? But what kind of riches do we want to have? We get the cart before the horse. In many of our cases, we get the goat before the cart or the donkey before the horse or before the cart. What happens is we want riches of here and now. Money rules a lot of things. But that's right backwards. The riches that we want are the riches in Christ. And then things take on a complete different viewpoint. I want to close by just mentioning we should add to this that we should give from a thankful heart. But I've really already touched on that part of it. I don't know how I could study what we've studied here and not think about are we thankful for what we have and all the opportunities that have come our way. I want to remind you that the people of Macedonia did what they did, surprised Paul in giving what they did, because they first gave themselves. And then you have to ask the question, have I given myself to the Lord in belief and obedience to the gospel? And I am a slave to him by my own choice because there's no other way to get to heaven than his way. And thus it's going to be reflected in what I have. There's going to be, as I said last week, all sorts of New Year's resolutions being made by people. I wonder how many of them will say, I'm going to raise my contribution for next year. Have you already been thinking about New Year's resolutions? Did you think that way? Did you understand that with every good work that we involve ourselves in, and we're taught to be ready into every good work as the Bible defines those works, 
that God will give us the wherewithal to accomplish them if we'll just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I, don't, I can't understand how he works all these things. I never have tried to in his providential working. That's his business. What's my business? Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. God's going to take care of us all the rest of the way through. We don't like the idea that to get from earth to heaven, unless the Lord comes back first, we've got to die. Every one of us in this room, think about it, is going to have to die some way or the other, a violent death, cancer, heart attack, COVID, whatever it might be. Every one of us, young or old, are going to go to our deathbed someday, wherever it might be. But that's the only doorway there is to heaven. Isn't that interesting how the Lord works all that out? But I believe he'll take care of us. Because he said, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of righteousness or life. If we fail to give, we fail to prosper. When you're thinking about giving as you have prospered, how do you determine your prosperity? Do you think it takes some thought on your part? And when it comes to giving and you have to be out of town or something like that and you miss the giving here, do you ever make it up? Church has to go on doing what it's doing. So we must understand how to give. We must give to God and we looked at these principles, giving on the basis of the grace of God and our gratitude and our generosity. Do you consider yourself a, a, a generous person? And then the principle of aggression, which is if we fail to give, we'll fail to prosper, not only now, but eternally. It's very interesting that when we think we don't have much, uh, God says you, you should still give more. Macedonians did. Inspiration recorded it. It's there to teach you and it's to teach me. And Paul said, that's the favor of God. He's done you a favor by allowing you to get involved in this. Now let's get practical for a moment. Let's stop the sermon. And see what we're going to learn this afternoon, if Lord willing, time goes on. Because I'm going to get very practical then. <laughs> if you're not a child of God, the best thing you can do now is give yourself to God. Right now, you're outside of Christ. You don't have hope of God in the world. And you're lost. I don't care how nice a fellow you are. If you haven't believed and obeyed the gospel, you're lost. I don't care what kind of moral person you are. If you haven't believed in Christ, repented of your sins, confessed your faith in him, and baptized into Christ, you're lost. You're separated from God. If you die now, you will go straight to torment. I don't like that. I didn't like it years ago. I did something about it. And everybody that's a Christian here did too. As a child of God, how are you living? Consider yourself a faithful Christian? The question is, does God consider yourself a faithful Christian? Because we all have to prove the sincerity of what we say we are. If you need to obey the gospel, if you need to be restored to the Lord, I invite you to come while we stand and sing.